On Device Research, we're on a mission to make brand impact measurement accessible to all and help provide clients with insights to improve their future campaigns. As a result, today we're launching a series of videos called Back to School with On Device Research. The aim of these videos is to help explore in more detail exactly what brand measurement studies are, how they work, what metrics are collected, and more importantly, how you use the findings to help improve your campaigns. So today I'm joined by Sarah Robson, Head of Sales at On Device Research, and she's here to explore in a little bit more detail exactly what brand measurement studies are and how they work. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So yes, so brand uplift studies, put simply, allow advertisers, media agencies, DSPs and publishers to measure um, whether the advertising campaign has actually changed brand perceptions. So for an advertiser, it will measure the ROI of the campaign. For a media agency, it can be used to inform which parts of the plan are working, such as which creative is working best, which platform you've used, which um, media channel. For an ad tech or a publisher, it can be used to add value back to their client to prove that the campaign's been successful, but also it can be used as case studies to, um, to be used for publicity for that, for that term, DSP or publisher. So what's wrong with the generic click-through rates that you tend to get at the end of a digital campaign? Yeah, so traffic drivers such as click-through rates, view-through rates, likes, shares, comments, only tell part of the story. They don't measure whether the actual campaign has changed brand perceptions. Okay, that makes complete sense. But how do brand studies actually work? So brand studies work by measuring the difference in brand perceptions between a control group, those who haven't been exposed to the campaign, and an exposed group, those who have been exposed to the campaign. To measure exposure, um, I truly believe that it should be done passively. So, um, for example, on device research, we used innovative tracking technology that allows us to measure if someone's been exposed to a creative bit on digital, out of home, social media or audio ads. OK, that's really interesting. But can you tell me a little bit more about how uh, the methodology behind them actually works? Yes. So the way they work is once you've got an exposure, which you've tracked through your um, tracking technology, that exposure is then matched against a research panel. Um, and then equally, you form a balanced control group um, of people who you know on that research panel haven't been exposed. It's really important that you actually have a balanced control group so that the only difference between the two is the fact that someone's been exposed to the campaign and that's what you're measuring. So to balance the group, you would balance things like demographics, age, gender, but also things like receptability to advertising, whether they're already customers of the brand, their experience with the brand, their category engagement, and so on. So that you're measuring a true objective um, difference between the two. That makes complete sense. So I have a much better understanding now about how it works when comparing metrics between control and exposed groups. But how does it work when it comes to understanding more around creative execution? So it's equally important that you look at your brand metrics alongside the creative um, measurements. So it's I believe that a, a bad creative will perform badly, whether it's been targeted very carefully or it's on the most premium content. So it's important in brand uplift studies that you actually measure whether someone's been emotionally engaged with the, with the creative. People who are more emotionally ingrained, it tends to move those brand metrics a lot more. But it's also important to see if the brand messaging is coming across. Did it resonate with the consumer? And equally, what actions someone wants to do afterwards. So are they going to go and search for more information? Are they going to go and buy the product? And so on. So I often say that the brand metrics give you the what's happened, but the creative um, message also gives you the why. Why has why that worked in that way? So you need the two to work together to have an effective brand uplift study. Perfect. That's a really good overview of the two main building blocks that are part of brand impact studies. Can you let us know if uh, you ever compare against other studies or other campaigns? And if you do so, how does that help determine campaign success? Yes, so if you're measuring the difference between the um, control and the exposed group, it's important to see how that compares to industry norms. 
So for example, if you have a CPG product, how well has that done compared to other CPG products that are advertising? Or if you're on a certain media platform, how well does that compare to others? So having a result on its own is all well and good, but actually you need to be able to benchmark that against some norms database as well. Thank you, Sarah. That's a great overview of brand impact studies and how they work. We hope you found this short video today useful, but if you have any other questions, please do contact us or visit our website at ondeviceresearch.com.